to Psalm chapter 100 and verse 5. Psalm 100 and verse 5. In this series that we're currently in, we've been talking about questions that people have asked concerning God. Of course, we've got Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas coming up. I've already got the title for what I want to preach the first, starting the first part of January. I'm going, to, I'm going to entitle the series, Be the Best You Can Be in 2023. How about that? We're going to talk about that. And I know God is going to bless. I have to get ahead of myself because David wants to know what to sing. So I have to be thinking ahead. Anyway, we've been talking about God. I have a question. And I trust that you've enjoyed the series thus far. Today we're going to be answering the question, if you're a good God, where did evil come from? This gets asked an awful lot by the people that I meet with almost on a daily basis. When they see the evil that's going on, in the world and the things that are transpiring both in the news and in people's family. This is one of the questions that is prominent. Why do people suffer? Why is there evil in the world? How can you justify that with God? We're going to talk about that beginning with Psalm chapter 100 and verse number 5. Notice that the Bible says, For the Lord is good, <clears throat> His mercy is everlasting, and His truth is endureth to all generations. What do you make of a God who created this world with some of the horrendous evils that goes on? Just watch the news. Just look at the war-torn countries. Look at the things that are, that are happening uh, and the mutilations and the things that are going on in the world in which we live. How can you come to terms with a God who would allow such monstrosities to go on and not judge the world or not cause the world to spin off into uh, oblivion. Some Jewish writers such as uh, uh, Jerzy Koniski and Eli Weasel began with a very strong faith in God, but as they watched their family being killed in the Holocaust, they had to come face to face with, with the with history's most grotesque and terrible things uh, in the killing of over six million Jews. They finally concluded, well, God doesn't exist. That was the conclusion they drew from watching family members killed in the Holocaust. Others just can't bring themselves to embrace a prospect that God, uh, that God doesn't exist. They they believe they don't know the answer or they think they know the answer, but they can't justify the fact that there is no God. Instead, they propose another possibility. They propose, instead of the fact that God doesn't exist, they propose, as Rabbi Kushner did in his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, that even God has a hard time keeping chaos in check. And that God is a God of justice, not of power. According to Rabbi Kushner, God is frustrated, even outraged, the, the evil, at the evil and the unfairness on this planet, as everybody else uh, but he lacks the power to change it. He quoted Eli Wesel, which I quoted just a moment ago, and he said, Eli said that if that's who God is, why doesn't he resign and let somebody else more competent take his place? You see, there's all kinds of theories and, and, and feelings that people have. If all these things could go on in the world, then how could God truly be powerful? Or how could God truly be compassionate? Either God created evil in itself, or in himself, he is evil himself. And because he's evil, all of this comes from his evil side. Other people say, oh, you know, good and evil, they're two equal and opposing forces in the universe. Just like <coughs> the movie that you see, Star Wars, where they talk about the force being both good and evil. God has no control over evil. And he doesn't know whether good or bad will ultimately win out. He just knows that they both exist. 
Or maybe God doesn't exist at all. So these are things that people feel and say out loud because they don't have an answer to the fact that if God truly is powerful and God truly is compassionate, then how could he allow the things go on that go on in the world? So let's tackle this question. This question, does the presence of evil exclude the existence of a good God? That's really what it boils down to. Because there is evil in the world and because some of it is horrific, does that exclude the very presence of a God who is good? <clears throat> now, by the term good God, I want to, it, it's a loaded term and one that I want you to understand what I mean. By good, I mean that God is free from sin. God is free from evil. God is free from darkness of any kind. So by good, I mean that he has the best interest for his creation at heart. When I talk about God, I'm talking about a being that is <coughs> all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, a God that certainly would have the power over that which is evil. In our text, when we look at the Bible, we find a number of times, but I chose this verse because that's the very premise of what the psalmist is writing. He said, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. You see, he loves us. Amen? Amen. He loves us and he wants the very best for you because he's your father. Not only is he good, but the Bible tells us that he created everything as good. All you got to do is go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 31, and it says God saw everything that he had made, and behold, what? It was good. It was good. So when he created it, he created all things as good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. Well, then that settles it. There must be a good God who established a good creation. And the Bible is obviously flawed then in, in what it asserts. And you'd have to agree the Bible is filled with error, right? You'd be wrong. Wrong. Here's something that atheists often overlook in alleging the, the very presence of evil precluding the presence of a God who is good. For example... I want you to understand that the recognition of evil means there must be an uh, objective standard of right and wrong. What do I mean by that? Think about it just a minute. To categorize things uh, uh, or actions as being evil means that there has to be a criteria for what is right and wrong, a criteria for what is good and bad. <coughs> There has to be something that we can say is the standard of good and the standard of right. On what basis do you label something as being evil then? If there's not a standard, if there's not a heavenly yardstick, then how do you know that something is evil or something is good? You see, there must be a standard, a cosmic yardstick. Evil points to the existence of a good God, not to his absence. And that's the one thing that I want to make very plain today. Just for the fact that there is evil in this world, we know what evil is. There must be a God who represents that which is good. It seems that all human beings have this innate sense of what's right and what's wrong. I don't care where you travel. I've been in a lot of countries. I've talked to a lot of people who've come from a lot of backgrounds. And in doing so, I have found that almost everywhere I go, people I talk to, know that certain things are wrong. <coughs> Doesn't matter what country you go to, murder is wrong. Rape is wrong. Child abuse is wrong. Stealing is wrong. And it's even worse if you're stealing from me. That really gets bad then. People know what the difference in right and wrong is. Where do we get this ability to distinguish right and wrong if it wasn't from God? That's the question. Another facet that you, uh, that you need to notice is this. Evil, evil rules out the possibility of evolution. 
Evil rules out the possibility of evolution. There is an old fairy tale that says frog plus princess equals a handsome prince. But in this day and age, with the belief of evolution, that has been changed to frog plus 10 billion years equals a handsome prince. <coughs> you see, <coughs> pardon me, evolution says that life happened by a series of random cosmic events over eons of time. They say it started with a big bang. It went through the primordial soup became a single-cell organism, which became a fish and ultimately a human. When I discuss, even in an academic setting, the matter of evolution, I'd put it very simply. Evolutionists believe once we were goo, then we belonged in a zoo, and now it's you. That's primarily the, the way that people would feel. You see, they believe at one time there was a one-cell amoeba who decided that the best food could only be chased if we had fins. So that one cell, after a million years, became a fish. And as the fish would swim around, he noticed that most of the best bugs were up in the trees. So he decided what he needed was a set of legs. So after a million years or two million years after making that decision, Jane, he decided to grow legs and grew legs so he could walk on land. As he began to walk on land, he noticed that he needed a tail so he could climb up on the tree. He grew a tail after a few million years, and then as he was swinging through the tree, the tail snapped off and he fell to the ground. He put on a bow tie, and now he teaches this garbage in college. You see, the fact of the matter is, folks, this matter of good and evil and God's existence countermands, counteracts everything that evolution stands for. Why do I say that? Because if you study it long enough, evolution has the one premise that by evolution we have become better and better. But all you've got to do is watch the news and you've got to listen to what's going on and it countermands because evil is a destructive thing. After billions and billions of years of evolution, it would look like that we would be inclined to that which is better instead of that which is worse. So, does evolution exist? I would say no. The presence of evil doesn't rule out the possibility of a good God, just the opposite. It points to the greater likelihood that God actually exists. And man has pulled away. Okay, now... We take it uh, as a given then. There is a good God. And that raises another trouble question. If there's a good God, did God create evil? Did God create evil? Now, the answer, of course, to that question is what? No, God didn't create evil. A good God, as the Bible describes, can never create evil. He won't tolerate sin in his presence, much less create sin. That's not what God did. I want you to listen very carefully to this statement. Look at it. God didn't create evil, but he did initiate the potential for it. Now, what do I mean by that? God didn't create evil, but he did initiate the potential for it. I was reading some time ago a book entitled The Case for Faith, written by Peter Keft. And this is what Peter said. He said, God created the possibility of evil. People actualized that potentiality. This source of evil is not God's power, but mankind's freedom. Now, I'm going to elaborate on that. You see, humanity is distinct from the rest of God's creation, whether it's a dog or a cat or a deer or a muskrat. The fact is that mankind is distinctly different from the animal kingdom, from the vegetation kingdom. It's different. We have the privilege of being made in God's own image. What does that mean? It means that we have the ability to choose. God has the ability to choose. We're made in God's image. We have an ability to choose. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth 
and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, male and female created he them. You see, there's a multitude of nuances concerning the image of God, but one thing that is very clear, because we are created in God's image, we were given one thing that the animals do not have. We have the ability of free will. We have the ability of, of freedom to make choices. God gave in the Garden of Eden all that they needed to eat with one tree that he said, do not eat of it because when you eat of it, it'll cost you your life. Man had a choice and he chose the wrong thing. You see, we have freedom. We have free will. J.I. Packer in his book, Your Father Loves You, put it this way. He said, the assertion that human beings are made in the image of God confirms the, the genuineness of of each man's freedom. Experience tells us that we are free in the sense that we make real choices between uh, alternatives and, and could have chosen differently. And theology agrees. Self-determining freedom of choice is what sets God and his rational creatures apart from, say, birds and bees and, and moral beings. So the point of the matter is that we have been given the ability to choose right or wrong. God created us. We have a choice. But I want you to notice that humans and angels have the ability to choose. Now, the Bible tells us that the only creatures who have that ability are humans and are angels. And I'm mentioning angels here because in a moment I want to talk about Lucifer who was an angel who made a choice. Now, I want you to notice here that understanding that God didn't create us because he needed us. Sometimes I've heard people say, well, God created us because he needed us. No, God didn't need us. God didn't. He is self-sustained. He is El Shaddai. He is everything. He didn't need us. And I'm not really sure why he did, but he made humans and angels with the to have a relationship with himself. For a real relationship to, to occur, there has to be the freedom of choice. You see, I'm married to Terry. We have a relationship, but she had to say yes every day. <laughs> every day. You see, relationships come because you make a choice. If I just said, well, you're going to be, you're going to be my wife. You don't have a choice. That's not a relationship. We have relationships with other people because we choose to let them into our lives. And we choose to let our lives be part of their lives. And the same thing is true with God. He wants to be in a relationship with you, but he gives you the choice. You can choose not to get saved. You can choose not to be in a relationship with God. You can choose to turn your back on him, or you can choose to be his child. There's a running theme throughout the Bible. Make a choice. Make a choice. God desires that we choose to be in a loving relationship with Him. And the only way that, that that can truly happen is if we use our ability to choose and our freedom to choose and we say yes to God's invitation. What's it called when somebody forces somebody else into a relationship. It's called rape. And I'm saying that God will not rape you. God will not force you into a relationship with Him. He gives you the dignity of freedom of choice to freely accept Him or reject Him. Our ability to choose carries with it the potential to choose the wrong thing. I have the choice of robbing a bank or not robbing a bank. But just the fact that I have the choice, I could choose to rob the bank just as easily as I could choose not to. God created everything good, Genesis chapter 1. He created everything good, and with, He created it with freedom, but with freedom came the potential of evil. With freedom comes the potential of making the wrong choice and choosing to do that which is sin. We have indeed 
actualize that possibility in that we have become creatures of choice and turned our back on God by choice. So I want you to notice several things. I want you to notice, first of all, that evil is goodness gone bad. Evil is goodness gone bad. I mentioned last week, one of my favorite books is written by C.S. Lewis. The book is entitled Mere Christianity. If you don't have it, you should have it. But Mere Christianity, written by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, wickedness, when you examine it, turns out to be the pursuit of some good in the wrong way. You can be good for the mere sake of goodness. You cannot be bad for the mere sake of badness. You can do a kind action when you're not feeling kind and when it gives you no pleasure simply because kindness is right. But no one ever did a cruel action simply because of cruelty is wrong, only because cruelty was pleasant or useful for him. See, goodness is, 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 so to speak, in itself, it is something that seeks its own self. Badness is only spoiled goodness, and there must be something good first before it can be spoiled. Now, let me, let me illustrate that what he's saying here from science. This is a great, to give you a greater understanding. There's really no such thing as cold. There's no such thing as cold. Only varying degrees of heat. We don't measure cold. Am I right? We don't measure cold. We measure heat. Cold is the lack of heat. The weatherman never says it's going to be 30 degrees cold of cold. We measure heat. You can think of good and evil the same way. Good had to exist first. And because it existed first, evil is the perversion of goodness. I guarantee you that if you could speak with people that have committed atrocities, most of them would say that they did it because they were feeling mean or they were feeling less than good. In their own mind, they had perfectly legitimized reasons why they were going to do what they did, why they wanted to kill, why they wanted to maim, why they wanted to steal. They had perfectly good reasons. They wanted some kind of good for themselves or for somebody else, but they went about it obtaining it the wrong way. Oh, I robbed the bank because I wanted to be able to better provide for my family. They wanted something good, but they went about it the wrong way. And this is what happens in being, uh, to the being, uh, well, the, that we now know as the devil. The devil was created a certain way. His name was Lucifer. I want you to notice what the Bible says about him. Remember, he was good, but then he became evil by choice. It says in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, that's speaking of Satan, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, describing what Lucifer looked like. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and the pipes, were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Verse 15, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Lucifer was the most beautiful creature that God ever created. When he would fly, literally his wings would make beautiful music. He was a gorgeous creature, but he decided one day that he didn't want to be good. He wanted to be God. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14. There came a day, and God said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. And in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, I feel that pride was the very root of Satan's problem. He wanted to be elevated to be God. He wanted people to worship Him. He wanted folks to bow before Him and not to God. A worship which only God deserved, He wanted for Himself. The Bible tells us that He is the one who first enticed humanity. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that uh, that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You see, that was the first evil act recorded. That was the first one. Humanity was created good. You know what the Bible says? Humanity was created good, but they were created with the choice, with the freedom to do with that good what they wanted. God placed a tree in the garden for a choice. Our choice in the garden was to rebel through Adam and Eve. God had thoroughly warned the man God had thoroughly warned the woman not to eat of the fruit of that tree. Yes, the devil made the offer, but it was man that made the choice. And that happens in your life, in my life. Satan will place something before you to make a choice. You can be mad or not be mad. You can steal or not steal. You can lie or not lie. You can use bad words or not use bad words. You have the choice. And so many times, like Adam and Eve, we choose the wrong thing. God is good, God is powerful, God is perfect. But God has created you with freedom to choose. Because He wants a relationship. He wants a relationship. Even if it weren't around. Even if that tree never existed in the garden. Even if we had been there and Adam and Eve were not the ones that were there, we would have done exactly the same thing. I want you to notice what James tells us. James says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So even if we're in agreement with this point, maybe you might be saying, well, why, does God, why doesn't God do something about evil right now? Why does he allow it? Does it serve some kind of purpose for him? Is it... Is it uh, necessary for some reason in God's plan? Is evil necessary? If it is, then why? Let me just offer some possibilities about evil. You see, we can't see God's larger picture. God said, my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. We can't see God's larger picture. Our finite minds struggle to make sense of God's infinite plan. By, by way of analogy, Norman Geisler used a scenario of a man walking his dog. And actually he said, very simple in his book, The Roots of Evil, he said if the animal gets his head wrapped around a post and tries to continue running forward, he'll only tighten the lead the more. Both dog and owner are after the same end, forward motion. But the owner must resist the dog by pulling, the, uh, pulling him opposite. The master sharing the same intention, but the understanding better than the dog where he really wants to go takes an action precisely opposite to that of the dog's will. You see, God knows where He wants you to go. God knows what He wants to accomplish in your life. But like that dog, you would rather wrap yourself around a pole than to go God's way. And sometimes God has to pull you back. God has to straighten out that leash. You see, even evil serves 
God's ultimate good purpose for humanity. What I mean? I mean what Paul said in Romans 8, 28. Paul said, all, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. He didn't say all good things work together for good. He said all things work together for good. Even that which we allow in our lives as being evil, when we make it right, God can work something in your life uh, that will bring glory to his name. Norman Geisler, in that same book, The Roots of Evil, said the highest good the highest good are dependent on the, the preconditioning of evils. Where there is no tribulation, patience cannot be produced. Think about it a minute. If you didn't go through tribulation, you would never learn patience. Even the Bible says that. Out of tribulations comes patience, and patience comes long suffering. Matter of fact, it tells us to, to uh, comfort people with the comfort whereby we've been comforted. So the highest good is dependent on preconditions of evil. Where there no tribulation, patience cannot be produced. Courage is possible only where fear of evil is a reality. If God created a world where evil never occurred, he couldn't produce the greatest good. Going back to Peter Keff, he concluded it this way. Only in a world where faith is difficult can faith exist. Only in a world where faith is difficult. It's, it's hard to trust God going through this hard time. It's hard to trust God that my bills are going to be paid. It's hard to trust God that, that my family is going to be okay. Only in a world where, where faith is difficult can faith even exist. You see, it's all a matter of timing. There was a farmer who absolutely despised God's people. His farm was right across from a church. And every Sunday, as the God's people were going to church, he would sit on his tractor and he would in the field and he'd be making fun of and cursing the Christians that were going to church. Well, that year his crop came in and he had more in crop than anybody else in the county. So he made a big deal out of it. He began to, he began to say, "See, you worship God. It's a waste of time. I, I didn't go to church a day in the world. I made fun of Christians and I made fun of your God. And my crop was better than any of your crops." And one man, who heard him say that, said, "You're assuming, sir, that God only judges by October." You see, folks, we say. And I've had people in the counseling center say to me, I didn't, God didn't strike me with lightning, so it must have been okay. And I tell them the same thing. You're judging the fact that God's only judgment will come immediately upon the act of sin or immediately in your lifetime. One day you'll stand before Almighty God and you will face it. If you don't face it here on this earth, you will face the judgment for the wrong that you do. It will come. So how do you respond? When evil comes your way, how do you respond? First of all, you join the resistance movement. The resistance movement, of course, is trusting and following the Lord Jesus Christ. He provides the way. He provides the example for overcoming evil. James says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Join the, join the resistance. Resi he says, Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Join the resistance. There was a Christian lady who had two prized chickens. One day they got over the fence into the neighbor's yard who got extremely angry. He was an old codger and he got mad and he took and wrung the neck on both chickens and threw them back in the woman's yard. Her prized chickens. Her children saw what happened and just knew that mama was going to go over and have her way with that man. But instead she took the two chickens and she prepared them. And she made two chicken pot pies out of the chickens. And she took her, her neighbor one of those and gave him a chicken. He knew exactly where the chicken came from. And it caused him great anguish in his heart. You see, 
she won him not by anger or not by sin. She won him by Christian love. And that brought about the change in his heart. So you need to very specifically join the resistance against evil. And secondly, set your hope on evil's ultimate defeat. Realize that there's coming a day when evil will be defeated. Amen. If you place all your hope in this world, you're going to be disappointed. If you think people are going to treat you right, you're going to be disappointed. If you think the world is going to get better and better until finally one day Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to get worse. There's another world coming. And this is the good thing. The world that's coming is going to be free from evil. Free from evil. As mentioned before, all evil, human evil, angelic evil is going to be judged by God. And this is not a perfect world, folks. But living here and living God's way, despite all of evil that we face, is the only way to live with the perfect world in mind. Amen. Knowing that one day this world will no longer exist and we will live with God in the perfect world, which he'll create. This isn't the best world. But we're on our way to the best world. Amen? Amen? We're on our way. You just have to realize you're not home yet. You're not home yet. You're in a foreign country. A country dominated by Satan and the evil. And, the, and you see it. But God can use that. Even in the, life, the lives of people who have turned their back on God. God can bring about in their life a desire to know something better than the evil that they're tied up in. And God can speak to their heart and show them life in Jesus Christ. You see, there is a God who is a good God, but He's given all of us freedom of choice. You see, the reason there's evil in this world is not because God is evil, but because man makes the wrong choice. May I say to you today, Jesus died on the cross to make a way whereby you can be a super abundant person in your life. Paul writes, I trust you'll let him be God, uh, uh, God in your life, no matter what you're facing. Next week, the question is, God, would you really send somebody to hell? That question gets asked quite often. Shall we stand?